to talk about this. God has been dealing with me uh, concerning this, and God has just really touched my heart about this. And so, I entitled this, Forgive One Another. Okay. Forgive One Another. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, I'm about to forgive you. <laughs> just in case you need to, you know, just in case you need to. In case you have, uh, you know, some anang love, you've got some... Uh, <laughs> the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who what? Believes. Say believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, let me just break this down a little bit, okay? And you're wondering, what does this have to do with forgiveness? Well, we have the word salvation there, and that's part of forgiveness, but I want us to see something here. First of all, we see Paul's attitude towards the gospel, and he says, I am not ashamed, I am not embarrassed by the gospel. A lot of people today are scared or embarrassed to preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And the true gospel says, Jesus loves you, He's not mad at you, and He wants to save you. That's the gospel in six words. Well, seven if you include the end. Okay? The gospel in seven words. Jesus loves you. Oh, no, a little more. Nine words, whatever. Okay, but really short. Jesus loves you, He's not mad at you, and He wants to save you. That's the gospel. Now, you can turn that around inside out, but the message is still a message of love and acceptance. Not a message of anger, not a message of justice, judgment, not a message of vengeance, but a message of love. That is the gospel. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed. You know, you need, you and I, we need to really search ourselves and say, am I ashamed of the gospel? Am I ashamed to talk about the gospel? in my workplace, with my friends? Would I rather laugh at their coarse jokes? Would I rather talk about worldly things? Would I rather be swayed by the conversation? Am I afraid to talk about Jesus with my friends, with my, uh, to my, uh, with my family? Am I ashamed of the gospel? We need to consider that because you know what? Whether we like it or not, if you are a Christian, you were sent to earth and you have a mission. Our mission is not to enjoy life. Our mission is to spread and to enlarge the kingdom of God so that more people will come into the kingdom of God, into salvation, and will be part of the family of God. That's our mission. Now, if in the process you happen to enjoy life, praise God. One day... All of this will end. There will be nobody else to save. Because all those that are saved will be with God forever. And all those that are not saved will be in hell forever. Save my, my, my friend because he ended up going the wrong. No, finish. This is it. This is it. God did not call us to simply enjoy life. For the heck of it. One day... We, see, God put Adam in the Garden of Eden. It's called, Eden means pleasure. It's the Garden of Pleasure. Our pleasure is not about just lounging around, you know, in the Caribbean and tanning ourselves and sipping iced tea and covered with Hawaiian Tropic, SPF 4, you know, kind of thing and, and stuff like that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But don't make that the goal of your life. You work hard so you can move to Hawaii or the Caribbean and, and, and just... Retire. I mean, you know what retire means? It means to be tired again. I don't know why anyone wants to retire. See? Just get some sleep. Right? There is no such thing as retirement. That's the invention of man. When you're done, you just die and go home. You're finished. It's over. Your assignment is done. There's no such thing as retirement in the kingdom of God. See, retirement is when you're finished working and you just want to enjoy the rest of your life. Why don't you enjoy while you're working? See, we, we've got everything backwards. But what God wants to do is not so much for us to just lounge around. He wants to give you a full...
full life. So that while you're winning the lost and making disciples, you're enjoying yourself. You've got health, you've got food on the table, you've got a good spouse, you know, loving you, caring for you. You've got kids that respect you. You go to a good church. You know, you continue to win the lost and make disciples. You've got gas in your car. Even if it reaches 100 pesos, oh, but it's coming down. No, but even if it reaches 100 pesos per liter, you'll still use the expedition. It doesn't matter. You know why? Because there's still a lot of money. God will give you, press down, good measure, press down, shaking together, running over. Why? So that He can send you out. Not just so you can go shopping in your expedition. No, it's so that you can use your expedition to go to the provinces and win the people, maybe even start a church there, raise up a pastor, and you know what? But see, these are the God wants to equip you, and money is part of that equipment. He wants to do that. It's not just so you can have a nice car. No. We are on assignment. And our message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our message. There is no other message that, can, that, that will rival the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now look at this. The Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ or Christ. For it is the power, not just a power, not just some power. It is the power. I mean, you want to talk about power, it's found in the gospel. You want power for salvation? It's in the gospel. You want power to break your bad habits? It's in the gospel. You want power to, to be able to uh, overcome poverty? It's in the gospel. Everything you need is in the gospel. That's why I am not ashamed of the gospel. Whatever people need, they will find it in the gospel. That's why it behooves you to know, to master the gospel. Ben Franklin said, jack of all trades, you must be a jack of all trades, master of one. The world changed, uh, turned it around and said, jack of all trades and master of none. No. He, ben Franklin actually said, you need to be a jack of all trades and a master of one. And his context was the word of God. You need to master the word. Before you master, if you're a doctor, your medicine and everything, if you're a lawyer, all the legal books, if you're a, if you're a, a, a whatever, you know, an engineer, all this mechanics and stuff, before you master all those things, you need to know those things, yes, because nobody will want to hire an ignorant lawyer or, or, or a dumb doctor, right? We want to make sure you know what you're doing. But know those things, but master the word. Master the gospel. Why? Because that is the power of God. That's the power of God that is released for everyone. See? First, uh, for everyone who what? Believes. The key to experience that power is believing. It's believing. That's your part. God's part is to release that power. God's part is to make that power work for you, in you, and through you. Your part is simply to believe. Somebody's sick, your part is to believe that when you lay hands on them, God's power now, through the gospel, will flow, touch that person, and heal that person. You cannot heal that person. Even Joseph said, when he was asked by Pharaoh, can you, we hear you can interpret dreams. He says, no, I can't. But God can, so tell me your dream. He had no illusion. He had no ability to interpret dreams. He had to rely on the interpreter of dreams to speak to him so he can be a blessing to someone else. So we ourselves cannot heal anyone. We cannot save anyone. But we have the gospel. We can believe on the gospel. We can believe on the author of that gospel, Jesus Christ. And that power will flow through you. Now, look at this. He said, for in it, in what? Verse 17, for in it, what is it? The gospel, that's right, very good, the gospel. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is preached. See, the gospel always preaches the righteousness of God, not the sinfulness of men. 
There is a gospel that keeps on pointing out the sinfulness of men. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ always points to the righteousness of God. And your salvation is His righteousness. That's your, your salvation is His righteousness. He did not save you. Your salvation or the work of the cross was not because of His mercy. When He forgives you, it's because of righteousness, not mercy. Mercy in Tagalog, awa. Na awa lang. O sige na nga, I forgive you. No, His righteousness Meaning to say, because of what Jesus did on the cross, I have to forgive you when you say sorry. That's why the Bible says that He is faithful and just. Nothing to do with mercy. He is faithful and just to forgive you if you confess your sin. This has nothing to do with mercy. It is His righteousness. That's why because of what Jesus did, anyone, Acts chapter 4 says, that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why? It is His righteousness. In other words, if you come to Him and ask for help and He chooses not to help you, He becomes unrighteous. It is His righteousness to do it. That's why you can enter into, into His throne room of grace boldly, knowing that if you made a mistake, you sinned. You can come in and say, Papa, I'm sorry. I messed up again. I'm sorry. Now, by the way, I need some money. And you say, sure, son. No problem. He'll not say, well, let me think about forgiving you first, you know. I don't know what you did. Whew, that was pretty bad. You lied to your mom. You know, lying to your dad is not so bad, but lying to your mom, whoo, you know, <laughs> daddies forgive faster than mommy sometimes, you know, sometimes, not always. But the thing is like, you lied to your mom, how, how can I forgive you? No, not with him, he is righteous. It's almost like he has to forgive you. You know why? Because of what Jesus did, not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did. When you come to say sorry, Jesus is there saying, Papa, don't forget, I died for him. So, uh, then there's nothing to talk about. There's nothing to talk about. You're saying sorry for what? There's nothing to talk about. Jesus died for you. His blood is still washing you. I don't see any sin. Now, mind you, I am, I am not for sin. I preach against sin. But we need to understand how Jesus sees us. He sees us through Christ. It's like, here's the Father, here's the Son, and here's you. He sees you died for your sin. Sin cannot attach to Him anymore. And He sees you through Him. And He sees the blood. And He says, you're okay. You're okay. What do you need? See, that's the righteousness of God. Now, this is all leading to... see. When God forgives, it's not because you prayed, it's not because you fasted, it's not because you said sorry. It's because Jesus died for you. That's why He's faithful and just to forgive you. That's why the Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, that if you are in Him and He is in you, then we have fellowship with one another and you with Christ and the blood of Jesus continually washes away your sins. In other words, you're still sinning. You are in the middle of your sin. Let's say your sin takes 10 minutes to complete. You are in minute number 5. You're not finished. You're only halfway through your sin. You're going to say sorry on the 15th minute, 10 minutes after you sin, or 5 minutes after you finish your sin. And even before you started sinning, He says, forgiven. That's how He sees you. And that boggles our mind. Because our forgiveness is so conditional. Why will I forgive you after what you did to me? Not once, not twice, not three times. I don't have enough fingers and toes. See? But Jesus said, hey, 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 70 times 7. 
That's way beyond. Your, you, have many, you have that many fingers and toes? You're weird. <laughs> Jesus often said, I was looking at my concordance, and Jesus often said, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven you. He was always saying, your sins are forgiven you. And I was looking at, I was looking at, um, he was so quick, you know, like, remember that woman that was crying by his feet, anointing his feet with oil, and then wiping it with her hair and everything? She didn't even say sorry. She didn't say the words sorry. She just wept. And Jesus said, Woman, your sins are forgiven you. No sorry. But you can see the repentant heart. And he spoke, Your sins are forgiven you. He was so quick to forgive. Every excuse. Any excuse he can, he can dispense forgiveness. Boom, it's there. Even if you don't say sorry. But if, you, if your heart is sorry, that's good enough. I release. I release forgiveness. He looks even for the smallest inclination of repentance. And boom, his forgiveness is there. In fact, even before you repent, his forgiveness is there. In fact, it is his, re it is his forgiveness before your repentance that brings you to repentance. In other words, he says, I forgive you before you say, I sinned against you. That boggles our mind. Our forgiveness is so conditional. Well, if you say sorry, okay, I'm sorry. Well, okay, if you kneel down, I'm sorry. Two knees, I'm sorry. Bowed head, I'm sorry. Sound like it, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll think about it. We're so conditional. We are, we are not behaving like a son of the Most High God. When He forgives. Let me show you something first, okay? 1 John, what does it say there? 2.12 I wrote to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake. Your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake. Not because you deserve it. He said, you know what? I don't care how many times you sin. You come to me, I will forgive you. But not because of you, but because of Jesus. For His sake. For His sake. You know why? He died for you. If I don't forgive you, I will mock His death. He said, I cannot not forgive you. I cannot not forgive you. In other words, it's almost like saying, I have no choice. Because of what my son did, I have no choice but to forgive you. I have no choice in this. His sacrifice was so acceptable, was so perfect. Anyone that says sorry, nothing to think about. It's done. You're forgiven. Can you imagine if our earthly parents were that way? That they were quick to forgive? Wow. How different would we be? This is not because of our good works that He forgives us. But for the good work of one man. The man Christ. Another thing about forgiveness is this. Colossians 3.13 says, Bearing with one, other, one another and forgiving one another... If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also, what? Must do. Everyone say must. must. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, you have no choice. You must forgive me. Go ahead, say it, say it. Especially to your spouse, if your spouse is there. See, now here's the thing. Watch this, huh? Even as Christ forgave you. The word as means like. The way Jesus forgave you, you must forgive one another. Okay? So the quality of His forgiveness must be the quality of your forgiveness. 
The frequency of His forgiveness must be the frequency of your forgiveness. The all-encompassing love of His forgiveness must also characterize your forgiveness. As Christ forgave you, 